if Christianity were true and it meant you had to give up everything to follow God, would you want to know the truth? I was a mama's boy. I, uh, every time we went out somewhere, if I were scared, I would run up to my mom. Um, I would stay very close to her. If I were sick, I would put my head on her tummy. Um, I was very, very close to my mother. My earliest memories are of my mother every day sitting me next to her and having me put on my skull cap and showing me how to recite the Quran letter by letter. I finished the Quran when I was five years old and by that time I had memorized the last seven chapters so that I could recite them during the five daily prayers. To be raised Muslim in the United States was a point of pride because we believed uh, that we had the truth. In my freshman year of college, my best friend and I had many conversations about faith. We argued all the time about Islam versus Christianity. But one specific day, he pulled me aside and he said, Nabil, if Christianity were true, and it meant you had to give up everything to follow God, would you want to know the truth? It took a long time before I was able to determine for myself even if I lose everything, it's worth it. And when my parents did find out, it was the most painful day of my life, probably the most painful day of their lives too. And I'll never forget the look in my mother's eye. Her whole life is Islam, just like my life was. And now my whole life is Christ. And there's just no, there's no, um, there's no connection anymore. But to have Christ in my life makes every loss worth it. My hope and my prayer for this book is that everyone who picks it up would draw closer to one another. Muslims by understanding the gospel, Christians by understanding the passion and the love that Muslims have, and ultimately through all of this, so that we can arrive at the truth and at a glory that will be given to God. Welcome back. Nabil Qureshi was born a Muslim. By his own account, he loved and practiced Islam devoutly. And yet, he made the unexpected journey to Christianity. What did he find lacking about Islam? And what attracted him to Christianity? I'm here with Dr. Shabir Ali to review Qureshi's autobiographical work, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Now, Dr. Shabir Ali, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Thanks for having me on. Now, you've had a chance to read the book. Uh, what are your initial thoughts on the book? Mm -hmm. Well, the book is very interesting to read. It's it's well written and it's compellingly read. Uh, yes, it's written almost like a suspense novel. Okay. Like you know, what's going to happen next? <laughs> you want to know? It's a page turner in that way. Um, very interesting little tidbits, humorous moments, um, a lot of emotion in in the book because his uh, turning from Islam uh, was uh, not handled well by his uh, family. So there were a lot of there was a lot of grief to deal with and and so on. Um, so all of that is very interesting and engaging. But uh, from an academic po uh, standpoint, I would have preferred that uh, he gave us uh, a, a simple timeline of events that uh, we, we can uh, trace historically uh, in order for us to understand uh, from a, an academic perspective why is it that somebody would choose one religion over another. Um, so, so this is, I had to piece through, for example, I had to uh, go um, create my own little timeline to discover, for example, that he must have been 23 years old when he uh, made that change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, and it, lacking that kind of um, timeline uh, d does not give us the, the, the full picture uh, in, in a way that allows us to evaluate his reasons for making that change. Mm -hmm. So he came from a religious family. He, he was someone who read the Quran, who prayed regularly. Mm -hmm. So what happened? How did he embrace Christianity? 
Well, as he explained in the int introduction to his book, uh, he will not be following a, a necessarily uh, blow-by-blow account and, and giving us uh, chronolog chronologically the way things happen. He's, he's taking some liberties this way in, in writing his, uh, his autobiography. Um, it, what, what he does in this book then is that he, he separates the two issues. First, his view of Christianity, and second, his beefs with, with Islam, as though they were two entirely different things, one examined by itself without interacting with the other, and then later on just the other. In other words, first he sets up the stage of showing us why he could, as a Muslim, accept Christianity, and then uh, secondly he goes into uh, ideas about Islam that he finds to be unpalatable or difficult to, to reconcile with. Uh, to me, it could not have been so detached. The two must have been in constant uh, conversation with each other. In other words, you must have been thinking every day, is it Islam or is it Christianity? And, and is, is it this belief or that belief, that belief from Christianity, that belief from Islam, constantly comparing the two. And yet that's not how he lays out the book. He, he just deals with one and then goes and deals with the other. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, a, is, is a, a flaw in the presentation in that uh, it does not allow us to see the actual picture. Uh, for example, if he wants to say that, uh, well, I find some things in Islam to be violent and I don't like violence and I find the Christianity to be peaceful, well, okay, that, that's, that's fine if he's uh, evaluating the two uh, simultaneously. But what he does, for example, is that he goes to the Quran, he finds some verses about war, he puts away the book, uh, he's disgusted by that. Uh, then he goes to pick up the Bible and he d decides, well, where do I start? Okay, I, I think I better start with the New Testament. So he goes and he starts with the New Testament. Which is much more peaceful. Uh, of course. So by doing that, he's conveniently ignored the Old Testament, which uh, depicts uh, many uh, occasions of war and, and violence. So you think it's not a, a completely intellectual exercise then? Uh, no, no. Although uh, I it is quite interesting that throughout the book, uh, Nabil uh, tosses and turns uh, with, with ideas uh, and, and he tries to evaluate them intellectually and he gives every impression uh, that, that he's dealing with this in a purely intellectual manner so, so that one should not get the impression that he's just arriving at the uh, conclusions to which he's predisposed. Like when you think he's arriving at, the, uh, at a conclusion that he will be predisposed to, uh, he starts criticizing the very position. So you, you get the idea that, that here is a man who is carefully evaluating every idea and criticizing them from every angle possible and then finally arriving at what he would deem to be the truth after all objections have been answered. But uh, in, in that too one finds that uh, his analysis is uh, lacking. For example, he does not consider all of the possibilities uh, if, if one is going to leave one religion and go to another one, uh, then that means one is so dissatisfied with one's own religion that one is actually seeking something new. Mm -hmm. And if you're seeking something new, then uh, do you just evaluate one something new or do you evaluate like a gamut of possibilities and then pick one? Uh, uh, so why is it only Christianity uh, among the world's religions? Why not Buddhism, for example? Well, it seems and like he had this friend, David Wood, who, who perhaps influenced him. Exactly, exactly. And I would add further, that uh, it's not only religions that you will evaluate, you will evaluate also non-religion. Like what about the possibility of being an agnostic if you're leaving Islam? Mm -hmm. uh, how does it go from Islam to Christianity as a one-way street? And, and you're right, according to the book, the, uh, his friend David Wood uh, was highly influential. So they and seem to be having conversations about Islam and Christianity. Uh, true, continuing conversations and in fact they became best of buddies uh, uh, to the extent that they would be in class and instead of listening to the lecture they would be giggling with each other and passing notes to each other. Well all of this is described in the book okay. in story, story style, uh, engaging and entertaining um, style and that makes it difficult to pick out the, the facts where, where they occur. And, and uh, I, I spoke about uh, um, Nabil's um, uh, reticence here it to, to uh, uh, evaluate all of the possible uh, scenarios and, and to pick the best one. Uh, one of the things I find uh, entirely lacking, uh, the silence about this is deafening, is uh, the, the description of his dissatisfaction with the particular uh, 
brand of what he calls Islam he, he was following. Let, let me be more specific. Now, uh, mo most of the world's population of Muslims are following what is referred to as the Sunni faith. These make up about 80 to 85 percent of the world following of Muslims. And uh, another 10 percent or so are, are the Shi'is, and then another 5 percent approximately, uh, 5 to 10 maybe max, uh, uh, is made up of all splinter groups. One of the splinter groups is um, is, is the one that follows a man from the Indo-Pak subcontinent, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who died in the year 1908. Uh, he started out, he, well, he claimed to be Jesus having come back, N not the actual physical Jesus, but someone in the power and spirit of Jesus. So whereas Muslims and Christians were expecting the Messiah Jesus to arrive down from the sky, he said he is the actual embodiment of the Messiah. He, mm. th there's no, Jesus is not coming back okay. as we expect but he is that Jesus. So he is the promised Mahdi, the guided one. He is the promised Messiah. He is Jesus and, and all of this. Uh, and that made him a prophet and he claimed uh, in his words to be a prophet. Now that spawned uh, two sets of, of beliefs. One is the mainstream of his following headed by his son Mirza Bashir uh, who uh, said that he should be taken literally. He is a real prophet, prophet of God. He received revelation from God and uh, uh, because he's a prophet, if anyone does not believe in him, they are actually non-believers. And uh, therefore, the vast majority of Muslims, including Sunnis and Shi'is, according to this definition, are non-Muslims. So they regard us as non-Muslims, and then the Muslim scholars uh, responded by saying, well, you're actually non-Muslims, uh, because you're following a man who claimed to be a prophet after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and this is impossible. Yes. So, so do you think Nabil is comparing you know, Ahmadiyya Islam with Christianity then, and, and finding the, you know, the Jesus of Christianity seems much better? Uh, well, uh, it's interesting that in his book he doesn't do that. Okay. He, 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 I mean, he mentions his Ahmadiyya upbringing, he mentions his uh, attendance at uh, Ahmadiyya conferences and so on, uh, but, but he does not get to this point of saying, well, what about the promised Messiah, our Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of our uh, movement, uh, is he Jesus or not? Is he the coming back of Jesus? Uh, is he the Mahdi and the Messiah? He doesn't address that question at all. And, and to me, it is hard to escape that question. You see, when uh, somebody belongs to a minority, whether a, a sect or, or whatever, or they have a particular uh, beef that they're trying to um, uh, advance, a, a particular um, motive or uh, policy or principle and so on that they're trying to advance. Well, they, they know that inside out and they know how it compares with, object with other belief systems and they're ready to answer objections. They're ready to defend their minority view against the majority. So if Nabil was so schooled in, in the differences between Islam and Christianity and so on and defending the Islamic faith, he definitely was also schooled in defending the uh, Ahmadiyya faith vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Sunni faith. He would have known something about the claims of Mr. Ghulam Ahmed and he either accepted or rejected that. Now, uh, I would have to, in the end, obviously he's re rejected that, but there is no place in his book where he compares this uh, founder's claim uh, with uh, Christianity. He, he just compares Islam, which is known more generally with Christianity. Mr. Birali, unfortunately we have to end there, but uh, we can take it up perhaps some other time. Thank sure. you. Sure. We'll take a break. When we return, we answer questions we receive from you, our viewers.